So thank you. Yeah, um, just to sort of say, uh, I am the chair of the certification committee. Uh, I've been working on it for the last three, four years now. So. Um, what I intend to do today really is just go through a little bit about the process, a little bit about what the tests involve, and uh, give you some information on how you can get your device tested, and then a little bit about the benefits of it as well. So these are sort of the things I want to go through. I'll run through it fairly fast. Hopefully that will give us a few minutes at the end if there's any questions on it. Um, if not, you can have a few minutes back of your life. So I'll make a start. So the first thing really is in the process. Um, so it's just a quick flow chart. If, I won't go through this in great detail. If you need this sort of information, go to the Law Alliance website. There is a certification page in there, and these flow charts are from it. But effectively, it says if you're a manufacturer and you want to do it, the first thing is, the easiest way is to become a member. If you become a member and you get your device certified, then it goes into the catalog on the web page, and as the Alliance, we'll promote it. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. So the first thing is, you fill in a questionnaire, and we've talked before about the security and all of those things. So these are the sort of questions that the test houses need to know. What features does it support? How does it work? What are the keys for it? Um, you then select which test house you want to do. And again, the list of the test houses available are on the website. Once those tests are passed, and only when they're passed, does the results then come through to the Alliance. And basically, it's the Alliance that sends out the certificate that says, here's proof that you've passed it. And we add it then at that stage to the website. So the website is always kept up to date with the latest tested devices. So that's the normal process. Um, what we've also implemented is So just trying to get it to go. Ah, there we go. So what we've also implemented is the process to do similarity. So this is where you already have either a device that's been tested and certified, and you've changed the firmware slightly in the application layer. Rather than go through the full retest, effectively it means if you can prove that you have only touched the application layer and nothing in the protocol, then you can do a paperwork effectively declaration that that's all you've done and send all of that information to one of the authorized test houses. If they're happy with that, they can then say, yep, yeah, we accept that you've only changed the application layer and allow you to, to go on and have a full certificate. Also, if you've used a module that is certified, if you can prove that that module hasn't been touched and you haven't done anything in your application layer to do, to do it, again, you can go through certification by similarity and you end up with a certified device which gets promoted onto the website. So that's really quickly on the process. So what about the testing then? So here's just a very quick overview of what that testing does. A couple of key things. We want to ensure that those devices behave as the LoRaWAN protocol says. So basically, the goal of the test is to guarantee that it actually adheres to the standard. We also, we didn't want to make any other connections on it. There's no test connections you need to put on your device. Most of the devices we're testing are going to be small, little devices with no other physical connection. So we wanted to make sure we could certify it through just the over-the-air interface. The other thing we want to try and do is keep this competitive in price-wise. So as an alliance, we can't set the cost, but what we can do is set the time it takes. So the goal has always been that you can do it within a day of testing. And that typically means it's automated testing. The testing will take between two and three hours. You have an hour or so to get it set up. You have two, three hours testing. And then you have time for the labs to write up the report from it. And that should ensure that if you have a successful device, it's a day only that you need with the test labs. And that's the best way of controlling it. When you look at some of the other mobile devices and things, they can spend months or even years going through certification. So our goal was always to keep it as short as possible whilst covering all of the features. And part of what we do through the certification committee is define the tests that are done. And there's always that trade-off between, OK, how much of the back-off mechanism do we try? How, much, how long do we leave it in this back-off mechanism? Because that all is taking time. So, um, and the other thing that we've tried to do is provide testing services to as near the developers as possible in any region. So we have five different regions. We have seven different test houses. Those test houses all have multiple locations. So 
in terms of the numbers of specs and the number of regions that have been certified and authorized, we're about 60 different sites and locations and versions of the spec now across the world. So we've got pretty much most of the area covered, most of the developing areas for LoRa are covered by test houses, and the test houses we have have global visi visibility. So if you need one in a new area that's not covered, talk to one of those test houses, they can then just replicate that system and set it up there. So how does it work? As I said, we don't want to touch it. So we have a little bit of certification application software that sits in the application, and effectively that allows us to do a mini loop back within the code so that we can send messages to it and get the response back from it. So without that physical connection, the only thing we do say is we also want to test how good and how reliable that is. So it is an ISM band. There'll be lots of other noise in there. So part of the certification is done in an anechoic chamber where we can guarantee the only packets this device sees are the ones that it's meant to. And as part of that, we then do the testing of the packet error rates and guarantee its reception of it. So how does it do it? So the device starts up, and it starts up in just its normal way, either as an over-the-air or by personalization. Uh, we do some basic tests, and then effectively it joins the network as it would do normally. Then we put it into this application mode, which is a specific command that we send to it. While it's there, effectively it does a few things. Um, it temporarily holds the normal application, and more importantly, it allows us to remove the duty cycle or dwell time constraints. We have a lot of messages to send to and from this device, and if we get caught by, we have to wait for the duty cycle, what should only be three hours testing will probably take us three days because we'll be constrained by that. So we temporarily suspend that. We get the device to send a packet every five seconds, and we get it to send either confirmed or unconfirmed, and we can control that through this little test application. And more importantly, every uplink contains what was previously sent down to it. So we know that that device has received it, and we can see exactly what it has received in the next uplink. So we can guarantee the two-way communication between it. We also do all the different encryption tests to, to generate different packet lengths and sizes to make sure that that is all encrypted properly. Uh, and then we do all the different over-the-air activation schemes because there's lots of different parameters you can set when you do an over-the-air activation. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit more about we've been asked to do RF performance measurements and evaluations of that, and I'll just describe at the end a little bit more about that. So a bit more about the similarity. I've talked roughly through this. I won't spend too long on it. If you use a certified device or you have a variant of an existing one, then basically the onus is on you to prove that you have done nothing in the application layer. Bearing in mind, we're testing the LoRaWAN protocol. So if you can prove that, and what I would say is when you're designing a module as well or you're designing a device, think about how you split the protocol and how you split your application. And if you can keep them as separate as possible in your design, it'll make it far easier later to be able to prove, yes, I've just spun out, I've changed this temperature sensor into a humidity sensor, and all I've touched is the application layer, and I haven't touched anything in the protocol. So when you're designing your device in the first place, think about how you partition it. Think about how you separate that code so that you can demonstrate that they are two separate things. You effectively then complete the self-declaration. Uh, you, you say it's exactly the same as the previous version in terms of the core, the software design, the clock design, all the sort of things that could affect the protocol. Um, and then, basically, you can then go to, back to the test houses and say, here's my proof, here's my information. And obviously, this is a self-declaration at this time. So the only thing I would say is, if at any stage we find what you've said is wrong, then we have the ability and we'll take away not just that certification, but any others that you've done through similarity. So it's a very useful way of, of getting multiple versions of the same device or similar devices certified. OK, so what are the tests themselves? I've talked about the different things. So we, we split them into sort of two main areas. We have the functional testing. And these are really what you would see by whether you activize by personalization or by over the air, how you do the test mode, the test application functionality. This is where the downlink error test comes into it. So this is where we now send, basically, 
60 packets to the device for each receive window for all the different spreading factors that it receives. And we're expecting to receive, or the device to at least receive 57 of those, which gives us a 5% packet error rate. So part of the test is we'll test that. The other thing that we do as well is we module we modulate the gateway because the spec says the receive window should be open 20 milliseconds before and 20 milliseconds afterwards. So we actually modify the gateway timing so that we actually test that your device can be tested 20 milliseconds before it's due to open the window and it can still receive it 20 milliseconds afterwards. So that's all part of what we do. Um, we'll go through all of the cryptography tests, so all of the things we've talked about. Frame sequencing, we'll check that you can't receive and don't you ignore any frame sequences that have already been used. And then we do the whole list of tests against the Mac commands. So every Mac command we send with all the different parameters that it does, and we effectively run through each one of those tests, testing them individually as part of that process. I won't go through all the lists, but you can see we've got the packet error rate tests, we've got all the different link ADR commands and the receive commands as well. So the other thing that I was going to talk about was the RF performance. This really came about by the European operators. They were all saying to us, great, we have a device, it's been certified, we know it fits the protocol, but we've put it in our network now and now we're having trouble. And what it actually comes back to is, yes, the protocol works fine, but whereas some devices were expecting to give us 14 dBm output power when we've actually measured them, They've been three, four, five, some of them. They've sort of been a long way off what they, even the manufacturers expected them to see. So what we effectively did was create a process or a procedure so that we could standardize within all of the test houses and even some of the operators how that measurement is done. So effectively what we're doing with that is we wanted to harmonize the approach so that everyone could do it. We wanted to say what you were measuring, but not necessarily the how, because all the test houses have slightly different equipment. Some have automatic turntables that allow you to rotate it. Others have static ones that they move it around. So what we set out was, let's do a 360 degree measurement of EIRP. From that, we can effectively determine which is the best position Ah, right, so I've got the best position. Now we've recorded that. We've also tested, okay, what's the output power in its worst position? But more importantly, I've now got the position that says this is the best one. So that gives me both its maximum and its minimum, and also you get this pattern on, that's shown on here, which basically just talks about how that looks when you've actually done the measurement. But what we also want to do is check that actually what's the received performance like? So we effectively say, okay, we've got a test set up which allows us to send packets to this device and see that it's received it. So we put it back into that area, we align it with the position where we got the best performance and we start sending packets to it, but all the time we're reducing the power from the gateway so that we're reducing the level that the gateway actually sends this to and eventually we'll get to the point where this is now seeing a 10% packet error rate and we say, okay, now that is its receiver sensitivity tests. So part of the test at that point then actually produces these two or three figures. You get its maximum output power, which for some of them, as I said, can be quite a shock compared to what they're expecting. And you also get its sensitivity, which if your design is good, should actually have a correlation between it. But we also measure the sensitivity at the different RX1 windows and RX2 windows, and we also measure it at a couple of different frequencies. And what we've just done recently is harmonize that so that the majority of the European operators are happy with the measurements that we're doing, and then they're using that to set up their network and be able to show really what their network performance looks like. So that's a bit about what it is. What are the benefits? Clearly, it's that reliability is the key thing we're trying to get out of this. You tested your device, we've tested your device, you know that it works. It provides that end reassurance. What it will also do is work under any network and under any conditions. And this is the bit that I wanted to stress is there are tests that run with particular network servers. 
but they're set up that they test them with the parameters that they want in their network server. What you don't want to do is it passed in this one and then go and take it to another network server where they have a slightly different set of parameters and it then fails because of that. So what we make sure is that we test it under all of those circumstances. Clearly, having done that, if we can find the fault while it's being tested, it saves you an awful lot of time. We've talked about firmware over the air upgrades and things like that. That might get you out of some trouble, but the last thing you want to do is find that there's a bug that's killed your device completely and it's now dead in the field. So by finding it now will be an awful lot cheaper to fix than it will be if you do it later. Obviously, from a marketing point of view, you've got the, the mark on it, um, which says this has been certified. And more to the point is it then puts you onto the website of the Alliance, and the Alliance will help push and promote your device. And the other thing that we've seen is there's lots of devices out there, and the LoRaWAN technology at times gets a bad press because devices fail. And when we actually look at them, they're a long way off. They've never been certified, but they've been put on a network. And it's the LoRaWAN infrastructure that fails and gets blamed for it because effectively it's, our oh, LoRa is no, no good, it doesn't work. So that's what we're trying to do. So really the final bit is those bad devices cause network issues and poor performance of devices will increase significantly the number of gateways you need to get a reliable service. So the operators themselves will pay more as well. So that's pretty much um, what we're doing. Just put up the, a big sort of picture. So the LoRa Alliance has recently had this certification mark registered throughout the world. Um, and when you have a certified product, that gives you the ability and the approval to now display this on your product. And we've effectively registered this worldwide now, so that it's not a trademark, it's a CM mark, which stands for the certification mark, and it's usable anywhere in the world from this point onwards. And as part of the package now, when you have your device certified, you'll get sent all the information about how to put this onto your product. And the final bit really is become a LoRaWAN certified device. We've got over 180 plus other devices now that are all displayed and on show and being promoted by the Alliance. And if you need any more, go onto the Lawrence, Laura Alliance website and there's a certification tab in that. Thank you. Any questions? We have a question here in the front. Oh. We've got time for one question I was about to say. <laughs> ah, and I'm already here, sorry. Better be a good one. Okay. Uh, I'm come from Brazil and I would like to understand why we don't have no products homologated to Australian because we're using the same frequency range. So, so a lot of it is we're obviously working very closely with the technical committee and the regional parameters and I cannot certify something that hasn't been defined from the regional parameters. So I'm working very closely with them. As soon as we have what we have as established from Brazil of this is the thing and it is very similar. So it's not going to take much to roll it out. I just need it fixed in the standard that will then allow me to roll it out. And then the very last question, what's happening at the, at the IMST booth? Thank you, yes. So I've run Where through, find him. I've run through the, a bit of the process. If you want to see the live system, go to the IMST booth over there. They've got the real server. They've got the test server running. They can show you testing devices. They've basically got, they're one of the authorized test houses, and they have the full test set up there. OK. Derek Hunt, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's do the next one.